And another exceptional individual is my next speaker. I first met Amanda uh, back in um, 2002 at our Monterey conference. She had recently completed a study done in the clinics in California. Uh, it, was, it was a very, very interesting review. You'll find it in our documented literature, and it's on our online education system. It's, it's involved in that. But uh, Dr. Raymond has continued that type of work, and she's here to tell us about California and what's going on in the clinics and what those clinics possibly should be doing in the future. Please welcome Dr. Amanda Ryman. Thank you very much. It is absolutely my honor to be here today and to talk to you all. You know, usually when people come to conferences, they're presenting answers. I do not have answers today. In fact, I have questions. I have questions that I'm going to pose to you as professionals in ways that we can move beyond safe access and create a system where the patient is an informed consumer of medical cannabis. So why now? What's going on where we need to move beyond this model of access into a model of informing? Well, we're seeing trends in patient sophistication and the dispensary experience. We are seeing many more first-time cannabis users coming into dispensaries who have never ever before used cannabis for any purpose. These individuals are asking us for good detailed information about how to maximize the benefits of this medicine. And they are expecting information along the lines of what they get for other medications that they may be taking, including potential interaction effects, side effects, validated symptom relief, and information about how that plant was grown and procured. At the same time, our more experienced patients are realizing that there is a variety of benefits that can come from medical cannabis and that they themselves may only be scratching the surface of how medical cannabis could be beneficial to them. And so they themselves want more quality information. We're also seeing a high variety in California of different strains at dispensaries. And while this does provide a great deal of choice for patients, it can also be a source of confusion, especially when they visit multiple dispensaries and they may see the same strain represented, but it looks and tastes and smells very different depending on where they obtain it. And dispensaries in California are also looking for ways to provide this meaningful information to patients. And we have some strategies that we've been using, and I think it's definitely on the right track. And that's why I'm coming to you today to talk about some of these strategies we've been using, some ideas that I have for future directions and research, and then to lead it with a call to you to start thinking about your patients and your communities and how you can make this information available to them. So some of the things that we're currently doing to provide information for patients is information about how the cannabis was grown. So telling patients whether it was grown indoors or whether it was grown outdoors. And sometimes you'll walk in a dispensary and you'll see the label of organic. And then we have a question of what does this mean? Who are we relying on to know that this cannabis is organic? Is it the grower? And if so, are they providing us with documentation showing how they are growing this medicine so that we know it's organic? We have what do other patients and staff like? So I've been sitting in dispensaries and you're in line and you hear one patient say to the other, have you tried any of those that they have today? Did you like any of those? Did you taste that? Did it taste good? I'm looking for something that's heavier. Do you have anything that's heavier? And even though these colloquialisms are very anecdotal, and I'm sure that if you put all this evidence together in a qualitative study, you definitely find some good scientific themes. But as far as how patients are making decisions, it not, isn't necessarily helpful when they get up to the front of the line and they're making a decision based on whoever else was in line with them who might be suffering from an entirely different illness with an entirely different host of symptoms. Another current model we use is how does it make you feel? What are the reported effects? And so you might walk into a dispensary and you might see the medicine in the display counter and one might say, sleepy, relaxed, narcotic. And another one might say, happy, clear-minded, social. 
And while I think that they're on the right track and that different strains do have different reported effects, I think we need to move to the next step, which is actually validating research, both survey and laboratory research, to show that these effects are actually reliable and valid across patient populations. Another thing we currently use is the idea of indica and sativa. And uh, Philippe Lucas had to leave this morning to go to San Jose for the MAPS conference. But in his talk yesterday, he alluded to the idea that maybe what we're really calling sativas are different, different leafed indicas. So again, patients might be feeling like, oh, this is a true sativa. Um, but what does that word really mean? How are we really operationalizing indica in a sativa in a way that's standardized across dispensaries and across patient experiences? And then finally, one thing that some dispensaries have started to do, which is a step in the right direction, I feel, is to give information about actual compound components in cannabis. So the level of THC, the level of CBD, the level of CBN. And I think that this is pointing to the idea that we need to provide this type of information for patients. But again, at the point, we're at the point in research where we're not that sure how valuable this information might be from dispensary to dispensary. Sometimes THC present, uh, percentage is displayed, and sometimes THC percentage determines the price point. And I would liken this to going to a store and thinking that the most expensive wine was the strongest and the best. So it's really just a very small part of the picture. So these are some of the strategies that we've really just started with in California, but then you have to ask yourself, so what is meaningful? What do we say when we say meaningful information to patients? Well, I have a few ideas of some things that we can start looking at. One is the issue of terpenes and flavonoids. You know, we've been looking and analyzing uh, cannabis at Berkeley Patients Group and finding just what Philippe Lucas found at the VIX is that the strains really do not significantly differ in terms of their THC-CBD ratio. And what that tells me is that patients are reporting very different effects. There has to be something else going on. And it could be the interactions of these compounds, and it could be the way that they interact with terpenes and flavonoids, all in the context of the patient experience. How hard could that be to measure? Yeah, easy, piece of cake. Another meaningful issue that we're talking about is standardized methods for growing with full documentation. So that if a grower brings a strain to a dispensary and says, this strain was grown organically outdoors, they have documentation that the dispensary can use to determine whether that's accurate. And I don't want to speak for all growers, but I have spoken to growers who told me they have changed the name of the strain of their cannabis on the way to the dispensary because someone tells them that a certain strain is garnering a higher price because of the market demand. And having a way of standardizing and documenting the growing process from seed to dispensary would help dispensaries make more informed decisions about the medicine that they're providing their patients. Another piece of meaningful information is I have THC, CBD, CBN, and everything else but the kitchen sink. Every year we seem to be coming up with different compounds and different chemicals in cannabis that are possibly related to efficacy, symptom management, and safety. And not only do these compounds and chemicals exist on their own, but they interact with each other in ways that we're just starting to understand, in ways that possibly form synergistic relationships that might be effective above and beyond each compound on its own. And I think that that's one of the vital flaws in some of the research that's being done on the federal level, where researchers are getting synthetic vials of THC and administering those as a, uh, as a proxy for whole plant medicine. And what we're seeing in California is that that's a very, very, very small part of the picture. Um, another thing that we're looking for in terms of meaningful information is validated effects. So again, you have individuals that say, oh, purples make me feel this way, or blue dream makes me feel this way, but we need a systematic way of looking at these differences through survey research, through point of sale research, so that we can start having a validated set of effects for certain strains of cannabis. So where should we go from here? We know that there's a need for more informed uh, uh, information for patients. We know that there's a need for this type of education. We know that we have patients with varying backgrounds when it comes to cannabis. They're gonna be looking for information so that they can maximize the benefits of their medicine. So I have a 
couple ideas, but then again, I would like to just throw it back to you all to come away and think about some ideas on your own. So some of the ideas I have are looking at the reliability of strains across dispensaries, or is all Purple Kush created equal? If I went and got 10 different samples of Purple Kush from 10 dispensaries in California, would they be statistically similar? Or would we find a very divergent pattern? If I took five samples of Purple Kush from the same plant, would we find very similar profiles? Or would we find significant differences? Survey research on patient reports of strain preference and symptom correlation. So as we know, cannabis is highly affected by set and setting. So it's very impossible to really get a good full picture of how different strains might relate to different symptoms without asking the patients. Asking them, how important is it to you that you find this particular strain? If you can't find it, what do you go to next? And what is your pattern for determining which strain you choose? Um, along with this is replications of studies like Philippe's using point of sale tracking to look and see if patients with different conditions are purchasing different types of cannabis over time. Plant analysis to determine similarities and differences of groups of strains used for specific symptoms. So we might find from a survey that individuals with insomnia significantly are more likely to choose a certain group of strains. So we take those strains to the lab and we say, why these five strains? What is it about these five strains that make those who are using for insomnia prefer these over all else? And all of this is really with the purpose of answering the question, what is it about this particular plant that helps this particular person in this particular context. And then, figuring out a way to provide this information to patients in a way that's easy to comprehend, easy to use, and easy to remember. Sounds easy, right? Well, informed patients help ensure benefit maximization of medical cannabis, but that's only half the story. Doctors, nurses, social workers, they need the information too, so that health professionals and patients can be partners in facilitating the healing process, both as informed consumers. So thank you very much for your time, and if you have any ideas, I'm at the Berkeley Patients Group booth, please come and tell me. Thank you.